Hi, my name is Kevin Jones from Rock Solid Knowledge. And in this video, we'll talk about how to add admin UI to an identity server instance that's running on Azure. This is one of a series of talks. And in previous talks, we've walked through how to set up identity server, including initially with in-memory stores. And we wrote an API client and a web client that use identity server. We then updated that to use entity framework stores, and then finally updated it again to use ASP.NET Identity for its user store. In this talk, we'll see how to host an instance of Identity Server on Azure, and more importantly, how to add admin UI on top of that instance. Okay, so where to start? So I already have an instance of Identity Server up and running on Azure. And we can see here, I can hit the URL for that discovery document to get back the information about that instance. And we can see, for example, that essentially here, the database that we have is empty. So we have no clients, we have no scopes, we have nothing in the database. And if I go and look inside SQL Server Management Studio for that database and do say a select star from clients, we can see there's nothing in the client table. So I'm going to start with an empty instance of Identity Server. I also have two app services set up for admin UI, one to run the API and one to run the UI. And for both of those, if I hit the URL, we get to see this page. So basically the welcome page for Azure. So there are various steps we need to go to to set up admin UI on identity server. We need to migrate the databases. So we need to add some new tables and some other things into our identity server database. We also have to seed that database with the data for admin UI. We then need to put the code for both parts of admin UI, the API and the UI into the Azure instances. And then we need to make sure that both instances are configured correctly. So the first thing I'm going to do is to update the identity server database so that admin UI can use it. So to update the databases, we need to migrate the identity server tables to use admin UI. And on identityserver.com, there's this blog post that tells you how to do that. And if you read this and scroll down, you'll find it points at two migration scripts. So this is the first one. So we need to run this script first against the database. Well, I'm going to do that just by grabbing this code and then running it inside SQL Server Management Studio. So here, if I just paste this code in and execute it, we see it executes cleanly. And then scrolling down further, we find another script. And again, if I grab this, and run this inside Management Studio. Again, that executes. Once we've done this, we then need to run the admin UI migrations against the database. And again, if I go back to this blog entry, it tells us how to run these migrations. So on this Windows machine, I have the admin UI API code in this directory. And here, I'm going to run this command. So I'm going to run all of the admin UI migrations. So migrate all. I'm running it against SQL Server. I also provide the connection string for the database to run those migrations against, which is my database up in Azure. So if I run this command, we see that it runs a set of migrations. And if I go back into Management Studio and refresh the tables, we'll see in here now some new tables to do with admin UI. Okay, so with the database setup, the next thing I want to do is to get my code onto Azure. Now, there are obviously various ways you can do this. For example, you could have a build setup on Azure and have that build deploy the code for you. I'm going to use FTP. And the first app I'm going to set up is the API. Remember there are two applications. There's the API and the UI. So we'll do the API first. So here within Azure, I'm in the API resource. And if I look at deployment center and FTP, Look at the dashboard. This gives me an endpoint for the FTP and a username and password. If I grab this username and the password and enter them into my client and connect, we see that essentially the folder here is empty. This is the www root folder of the site. So on my local machine, if I go to the folder that contains the API code, I'm going to grab everything in that folder and just upload it to the server. Okay, so once that's done, I can configure the API in Azure. So again, on the identityserver.com website in the documentation section, there's a section which talks about installation on Azure. 
And there's a walkthrough here. And this tells us what values we need to set for our admin UI configuration. And there are things like the DB provider, we set that at SQL Server. There are a couple of connection strings we need to set, the point at identity server, and some other values as well. So back inside my resource on Azure, if I go to the configuration section, then this is where we enter the values. And you can see I've entered these values already. And if I click on advanced edit here, we get a better view of what these values are. So we have the authority URL, which is the URL of my identity server instance. We have the DB provider. We have a couple of connection strings. We have some values around running migrations. We have the URL of the UI part of identity server, which will be the URL of the app service on Azure. And notice we also have the license key, which you can obtain from rock solid knowledge. Now, if you go through this walkthrough on the identityserver.com site, it doesn't mention the license key, but if you don't put that value in, then the API won't work. Okay, so with those values in place, we should be able to check that the API is working by asking for its Swagger documentation. So before I do that, I'm going to stop and restart the API to make sure the changes I've made have been picked up correctly. And then first of all, just refresh the page. We got a 404, which is expected. And then from here, if I go to slash Swagger, then we get the Swagger documentation. So the admin UI API is working. So if I go back to SQL Server Management Studio, so you can see that after starting the admin UI API, we now have data in the database. So for example, we have a new client. So admin UI, when it starts up, inserts itself into the identity server database so it is able to use Identity Server. Without adding this data, it wouldn't be able to use Identity Server. So next up is the UI. So for this, we'll do the same thing. We're going to FTP to the website in Azure. And again, I'm going to grab the files from my download of Admin UI. But before I do this, there's some edits I need to make. So again, if I look at the documentation, for the configuration of the UI, there are three values we have to set on the website. And these are the authority URL, the UI URL, and the API URL. And we'll see what these look like in a moment. However, there's a file we also need to edit. So in the www root assets folder, there's a file called env.js. So the values we set in Azure are used by the server side of the application. And the values we set in env.js are used in the client side of the application. So this is the file to edit and I've set these values already. So we have the API URL, which is the endpoint that the admin UI API lives. We have the UI URL, which is the endpoint where the user interface for admin UI lives. And we have the authority URL, which is the URL of identity server. And these three values are the same as the three values that were set on the configuration for the UI service for admin UI. So having done that, if I go back to the FTP client and upload the code, I can then apply the same configuration on the Azure side. So again, for my admin UI UI service, if I go to configuration, there are three values to add here. We don't need the license key here in particular. So we have the API URL, the authority URL, and the UI URL. I've added these already here. To add these, you just go to new application setting, put the name and the value. If I show you these again by looking in advanced edit, we can see the API URL, the authority URL, and the UI URL, and the same values I just added into the env.js. So again, if I stop the application and then start it. So now for the UI sites, this is aui-ui.win. If I refresh this, and then from here, I can log in. I can use the default username and password, which is info at rocksolidknowledge.com and password 123 bang hit login, grant the permissions, and we get taken off to the admin UI homepage. So I make full screen, we can now see correctly. So to set this up in Azure, we've had to create our SQL database. We've had to create an app service instance for identity server and configure that to use that database. We've then added two further app services, one for the UI and one for the API. In our case, we've used FTP to upload the code to those services and then how to configure these two correctly. So remember for the API, we had the configuration here, including a bunch of URLs and the license key. And then for the UI, 
we do something similar. We add the configuration here, but remember also for the UI, we had to update env.js. With both of those in place, we can hit the admin UI API. In this case, we can hit the Swagger page to make sure it works. And we can hit the admin UI user interface page, log in, and then use admin UI. So I just wanted to cover one more thing, and that is what happens when things go wrong. So deploying onto Azure is a little more interesting than deploying locally, as it's harder to get access to things. So there are certain things that we can do to help. So if I take the API service as an example, if I go into this resource down here, we can see a section on monitoring. And then inside here, we have this thing called app service logs and log stream. And it's the log stream that you want to look at for things like exceptions. So for example, if you deploy admin UI and find it doesn't start for whatever reason, then the log stream may be the first place to look. So if I go into here, we can see there are two parts to this, application logs and web server logs. And currently it says the application logs are switched off. And to switch them on, you go to the app service logs section, which is the entry above log stream. So if I go into there and here, I can turn on application logging. In this case, I'm going to turn on to the file system. I can specify an, a level. And here, let's just say verbose so that we can see some entries in the log. And then there are other things I can turn on as well. So I can turn on web server logging. And if I do that, I have to specify a retention period. And I've previously set this to five. And then once we have that, we can do a save. And if I go back and look in the log stream, it now knows the logs have been enabled and it connects. So if I go back to admin UI and refresh, then we can see we get some entries in the stream output. Now, this is a little bit temperamental. So for example, after you've turned logging on, you may need to refresh the website before you get any outputs in the stream. So this is one thing we can do. And in here, for example, we might get any IIS errors that have happened. If you want to trap more application level logging, then you can do that as part of the application deploy. So one of the files that we deploy when we deploy the application is the web config for the application. And in here, we specify how to run the process in this ASP.NET Core element. And along here, there are two other values, standard out log enabled, and that's set to true, and then standard out log file. And this specifies two things. It specifies a directory into which to put the file and a prefix for the files that are stored in that directory. And this is relative to the www root directory of this deployed application. So to use this from my FTP client, I'm within the directory where the application is installed. And if in here, I'm going to create a new folder called logs. And once I do that, if I refresh the site and go back to my FTP client and look in the logs directory, then sure enough, we now have a file in here with the prefix stdout. And you can download this. Now, be careful if I try and download this now, it tells me it's in use. So if you want to download the current log file, you'll need to stop the service first. And then you, you may need to wait a minute or so before the lock is freed. And you can do this both for the API service and for the UI service. And with both of these things in place, you should get enough information about any errors that occur. Now, if you turn on the logging and you still find things don't work, then you can get help from identityserver.com. So if you need one-to-one -one developer support, then please email support at identityserver.com.